and welcome back to my video series on a theory of consciousness. As you'll recall, the basic goal is to create a bridge across the explanatory chasm. The explanatory chasm that exists between the realm of neurology and the realm of first-person experience. In the previous video, we started with a sketch or a scheme that described the way consciousness felt purely from a first-person perspective, and incrementally moved it closer towards the center of the chasm. I also mentioned that any theory of consciousness needs to be able to address our common first-person ideas of what it's like to be conscious. And I identified two fairly simple examples. The first was automatic memory stimulation, and we closed the last video with a description of that. In this video, I want to address the second common example, verifying a memory or mental back and forthing. In other words, we started by acknowledging that one of the activities or abilities we have as first-person conscious beings is to be able to hop back and forth from the realm of the external to the realm of the internal, from the act of consciously inspecting a situation or object in front of us to a remembered internal image of a situation or object. And by doing this back and forth comparison, we can verify if the object in front of us is the same or different than the one we remember. As an example, I described a scene where you're walking down a city street and up ahead you see someone that looks familiar. So that's the main goal of this video, to demonstrate how the brain might perform this back and forth activity. In addition, I also want to fill in a few missing details and caveats of my theory that I haven't addressed yet. In the first example, our conscious organism encountered an object that was an identical copy of a previously encountered object. In this example, we'll see what happens when it encounters an object that is almost identical to a previously encountered object. In this diagram, we see our conscious organism encountering object B. It's preoccupied with the visual information, and so we see the appropriate primrons and duprons becoming stimulated. And in this case, there appears to be a pre-existing patron that has already ensembled these exact duprons, meaning that this exact visual pattern has already been encountered in some previous object. Next, we see a similar situation with the tactile information as a pre-existing patron becomes stimulated. Also, as in the last example, because a certain threshold of input activity has occurred, we see a previously existing abron, abron T, becoming stimulated. Now, at this point, if our conscious organism was lazy or was in a hurry or just now became distracted by something, it might believe that it had, in fact, already encountered this object before. That is, it could hyperstimulate the abron, and it would experience an image of object T, complete with T's odor quality. However, because it's not in a hurry, it actually takes a whiff of object B, perhaps expecting it to exude the fragrance of T, but it's somewhat surprised to find it actually has a different odor. In other words, when it consciously considers the internal image, when it actively hyperstimulates abron T and focuses on the characteristic of odors, it readily discerns the dupron associated with it, dupron T3. However, when it returns its attention to the external object and again takes a whiff, it is readily able to discern that it's not odor T3, but odor B3. Just as from a first-person perspective, if we're not really sure or we don't want to believe that this new object smells different than what we expected, we'll spend time thinking about it trying to stimulate the internal image to see if we can't learn something more from it or to verify what we are experiencing. As we do, we're essentially comparing imagery from our internal memories against the real-time external imagery. I now want to fill in some of the details of this scheme of consciousness. By now it's pretty obvious that the CAS or central activating system is the key player in the overall theater of consciousness. In essence, it's a complex, dynamic, network-like switching system it's the aspect of our mental self that we can most readily identify with when we're in the process of trying to remember something. For example, suppose you're at a big party and you see a person far across the room. You know you've met this person and you also know that you know their name, but right now you can't seem to remember it. By some natural, inarticulable means, you direct your conscious energy in the search for this name. Somehow you know where to look. That is, it isn't the same mental place you'd look if you were trying to remember where you parked your car or your mother's birthday. You mentally know where to look for this person's name, and as you do, as you exert a type of mental energy and effort, you begin to hear or sense candidate names. Eventually, if you're lucky, you'll succeed in locating and stimulating the actual patron associated with it. 
Just as from a first-person perspective, just as we can hunt for missing information or details, so too is the case with the CAS. The central activating system is capable of actively stimulating patrons and abrons, as well as searching for abrons that are only partially stimulated. We could say that it has a seek function and a stimulate or activate function. By seek, I don't mean that it physically moves or slithers or meanders through the brain, but as a complex network, it's able to essentially reconfigure itself on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, effectively activating certain connecting links or circuits that were dormant while deactivating others that are no longer needed. Now, on one hand, this theory may seem kind of like science fiction, rather far-fetched or too implausible. It may seem to be just too complex for the old brain to accomplish. However, given the fact that the brain has billions and billions of neurons, each with as many as 10,000 links to other neurons, and given the inherent complexity of any one neuron, I think it'd be more of a stretch to say that our brains wouldn't be capable of this. Also, the CAS shouldn't be confused with some type of Cartesian self that actually has the experiences or experiences the qualia encoded by the primrons and duprons. Rather, it's a type of accomplice, a co-contributor, or an enabler of the overall experience. As I describe in my book, Evolving Towards the Truth, as well as in several of my other YouTube videos, it makes no sense to talk about our Cartesian self that does nothing but have sensations. Rather, at the moment of experience, the sensations, the qualia, are essentially self-expressing sans experiencer. However, I want to be quick to add that this isn't all there is. I contend that conscious experience actually consists of two channels of information. Yes, there's the raw qualia, but there's also context. As mammals, as human beings, in our pragmatic, everyday, stressful worlds, we don't live in a world of individual qualia. No, we live in a world of objects. And of course, these objects, at least from the perspective of our conscious minds, are the collection of the pertinent qualia associated with that object. The qualia are somehow all linked together in our mental space. We don't just experience a chaotic mishmash or a stream of random qualia. No, they occur in sets, or linked together, and we somehow know they belong together when we experience them. We know red is the color of apples, we know spherical is the shape of a bowling ball, and we know that citrusy is the taste of oranges and lemons. Just as conscious experience consists of individual primrons and duprons, there's also an inarticulable knowledge of connectedness, a parallel side channel of context between them. Not only are these specific primrons and duprons associated or linked to a specific object, but the objects themselves have context. They in turn are linked to other objects, other places, other situations, other emotions and feelings. I know that a certain set of facial characteristics belongs to a certain person. I know that this particular person has a name that has a certain sequence of audible phonemes. And I know that this person lives in a particular building in a particular part of town. And the second channel of information, of context, is a result of neurons, systems of neurons that behave like patrons and abrons, and other systems of neurons that act like superabrons, linking together numerous objects, numerous people, etc., etc. Also, I've depicted the CAS as having a central nodule. First, I'm not suggesting that such a singular, nodular, neurological module actually exists in the brain. I'd be more inclined to think that it has a more dispersed or distributed nature. My own non-expert guess is that this is the jungle of connecting neurons that reside between the midbrain and the cortex, connecting the thalamus to the cortex and the cortex back to the thalamus. So there you have it. Consciousness is a collection of qualia and context, of two realms, internal and external, of a central activating system, primrons, duprons, patrons, and abrons. I believe this theory, this scheme, provides a decent mid-chasm target for those interested in modeling and simulating the way the brain makes a mind. There are several other interesting first-person mental activities that I plan to address in a future video, activities that I believe are also explained by this theory of consciousness. Among them are daydreaming and dreaming. I hope you found this video series worthwhile. Please be sure to leave your comments and criticisms. I'm Jeff Kosmoski. Thanks for watching.